One week after a Scarborough school shooting where police say a 14-year-old student shot and killed an 18-year-old, Scarborough MPP Mitzi Hunter has written an open letter asking Ontario's health minister to address gun violence as a public health crisis. She is calling for Ontario MPPs to pass Bill 60, which would allow OHIP to cover counseling services for survivors of gun violence and provide hospital and community-based violence intervention programs. Joining us now to discuss is Liberal MPP Mitzi Hunter, U of T Associate Professor of Social Work Tanya Sharp, and Leo Barb, founder and CEO of TDS Education. Thanks to all of you. Uh, Mitzi, the number of firearm discharges and shootings in Scarborough up 43% this year. Why is gun violence, in your view, a growing and a public health crisis? Yeah, this is a growing crisis, and you know, every time I look at the numbers, they get worse and worse and worse. There have been more shootings this year than days, you know, weeks in the year, and um, and and we now know that the shootings are becoming younger in terms of those who are, are perpetrating, and the victims are getting younger. Um, Toronto Police says the average age has fallen from 25 to 20, and so this is a public health crisis, and I'm I'm calling on the Ford government to take action immediately. We can't just have, you know, words of condolences as, as heartfelt as they may be. Our communities need a concrete response. You know, I, I went to um, this David and Mary Thompson school last week to pay my condolences to the school community, and, and they agree that more needs to be done. Um, this violence has now come into the school itself and this is a crisis if that's not a crisis then what is so leo i want to bring you in now as we listen to miss hunter talk about the, the fact that shootings are becoming more brazen in toronto and, and that those involved are becoming younger why do you think this is happening uh, well when you experience violence um whether at home in the streets or at school um it affects the mind it affects the mental health right and what happens is when it starts to compound, when, when kids are starting to be scared to enter into certain areas of their community or go down certain streets or, you know, interact with certain communities around them, it starts to build this, this tension. It's almost like a pot of boiling water. Um, it, it simmers, it boils, and then the lid starts to kind of rattle and eventually pops off. Mm. And so what we're seeing is a, is a population of young people that are feeling that tension, that have compounded emotional stress from multiple forms of from trauma that are now reaching that boiling point and we're seeing it in the streets and we're seeing it in the in the the numbers or with the shooting and now we have some data to show what's happening tanya you published a report uh, at the U of T that includes a homicide tracker for toronto so based on your research where are homicides happening which communities are most impacted and why well, what I want to say also is I really appreciate the, the, the candid and candor and the directness of my uh, colleagues on the panel this evening, because it really is going to take uh, a multidisciplinary approach to be able to address the systemic uh, impact uh, and intergenerational impact of uh, gun violence and fatality. Um, but what the homicide tracker is really pulling back and is seeking to un unpack are really the, what I deem as the social determinants of homicide. In other words, what are those structural factors that have contributed to the disproportionate impact of homicide in particular on African Caribbean and black communities throughout Toronto. And in the absence of race-based data collection, which is so paramount in, uh, in, in allowing us to be able to assess the scope and the magnitude of the problem, develop policies to, to uh, affect and, and implement uh, strategies to address the problem, and um, also make sure that we're giving community assurance, we developed the homicide tracker to be able to track that information. And so we're seeing uh, disproportionate uh, impact of homicide in communities like Melbourne and, and uh, Regent Park, uh, several communities in that area. Um, and as well as not only seeing the homicides in the area increase, but also um, a lack of culturally responsive services to address the trauma that chronic exposure to trauma that has already occurred. And so what this is going to really take is a public health response, both focused on prevention and intervention strategies that are community engaged and from the community. And at the end of the day, 
really to be able to measure our success by saying, does the community believe their lives have improved as a result of the interventions? Okay, that's a crucial tool for sure. And you talked about that chronic trauma these communities continue to face. Uh, Miss Hunter, so often, you know, a shooting is reported on the news, there's an outpouring of support for that community, and then everybody sort of moves on. We don't really think about that anymore. How important is it to continue to support these communities who are so traumatized? It's terribly important. You know, uh, I have the unfortunate um, experience of going to the communities after an incident because I want the community to know that I care and that I'm here and I'm listening. And of course, I'm using my position as a member to to, to change law, to bring resources to bear. And, and these are um, effective resources, um, you know, counseling services paid for through OHIP, hospital-based intervention programs that have been proven, community-based intervention programs that are culturally appropriate and that are, are really looking at more downstream interventions to prevent the violence from occurring in the first place. But what happens when I show up in these neighborhoods is that, you know, people will come and say to me, you know, uh, this one woman said, you know, if the bullet went through my window and how do I protect my children? and I can't sleep and they can't sleep. I want to know where they are getting help and support. Mm. The, 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 the neighborhoods can't afford the resources, uh, even sometimes to keep a roof over their head or to feed their families. So how are they going to afford these counseling services? And, and where would they find the trauma-informed mm. counseling services uh, that, that will respond to the deep issues that we've just heard on this panel today? You know, we have to create the capacity for the community to heal and, and this bill, bill 60 is going to help to address that and it's going to provide some immediate support and immediate relief that people need to heal. I want to point out something interesting. We're talking about addressing gun violence and I'm hearing a lot about culturally sensitive services, about social factors that contribute to this. We haven't spoke about guns. Uh, Leo, I wonder what your thoughts are on the mayor, John Tory, repeatedly calling for a ban on handguns. I, th I think it's an important factor to be to be thought of and to be acted on for sure. We gotta we gotta create more laws to stop the guns getting into the streets. I think that's a definite. But we also have to realize that guns have been a huge part of our culture from as long as we can remember. It's been a part of almost every facet of our society. Um, and so what we have to realize is we have to educate and support, you know, the, the potential users of those guns, right? It's it's not necessarily, you know, eliminating knives and, and knives are a problem or guns are the problem. And we have to start to support and educate those on both sides of the gun, right? Mm -hmm. The potential users of guns need to understand what are the choices that they're making and what are the emotions that are driving them to make certain choices like fear and anger and guilt. Um, but on the other side, we have, like, like the bill is saying, we have to support the, the survivors. We have to support the other side of the gun as well. Um, and if we forget one side of that uh, equation, we're missing the whole entire piece altogether. Absolutely. Uh, Professor Sharp, you talked about the data and the fact that the data paints a very disturbing image and, and that black communities are disproportionately impacted by gun violence. What do black youth need from their leaders? Mm. Mm, thank you so much for the question. Um, just in, in a, a project, a recent project entitled Invisible Moons, where we actually spoke to African Caribbean and Black youth uh, in Toronto about their experiences surviving the homicide of a loved one. And let me just say, on average, what their mm -hmm. uh, the data, preliminary data, is saying from that project is that on average, each individual is experiencing the homicide of a loved one at least three times in their lifetime. So we're not just dealing with a uh, community that is experiencing grief over here and over there. We really have to think about the homicides that are occurring right here in Ontario, but the homicides they're experiencing in their home country and the homicides they're experiencing among family members that are often in the United States, mm -hmm. right? So that's also why we're seeing such exorbitant numbers. But what, you, what youth are saying that they need primarily is a place, a space that a uh, sacred space that where they're allowed to 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 really unpack the the impact of grief. It is so pervasive and so chronic that oftentimes you don't even have a chance to catch their breath before the next murdered family member or friend is occurring. But so they need a space to really unpack 
what is happening to their physical, their mental and spiritual well-being as a result of experiencing uh, homicide, violence and victimization. Um, and what they're also saying is they need individuals across disciplines that they come in contact with on, on a regular basis, educators, EMTs, police officers, to be trained on how to engage with their communities uh, as a result of experiencing homicide violence. And that's really critical. And I think that's what they're talking about when we talk about being more culturally responsive in our approaches and using a public health framework. We all have a responsibility to basically respond to the unmet needs of this particular population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can I just say, uh, in support of uh, this this amazing conversation, you know, I, I think that for me, one of the things that I'm tired of is going to the funerals of young people mm -hmm. under the age of 18 in my community, and really, you know, talking to their teachers, their middle school teachers, their mothers, and 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 all of these people who come grieving this loss, and you know that. Is, is something that we have to put an end to, is, is people's undealt with trauma. And, and that just, just, just sits there, it doesn't go anywhere unless they get help and support. And we can provide that support as a society and make it available to the individuals that are impacted directly by this issue. Okay, it so is a public health crisis and we need to respond. Okay, so powerful words. We'll have to leave it there. MPP Mitzi Hunter, Professor Sharp, and Leo Barb, thank you so much for this conversation. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.